Hello, I'm here with Ed Conway, Economics Editor at Sky News, um, also author of 50 Economic Ideas You Really Need to Know, and more recently author of this great book, uh, The Summit, The Story of Bretton Woods. Hi there. Hi, nice to see you. Um, paint us the picture. So the world is still at war um, and has been at war for, for four or five years now. Um, D-Day has just happened, but the war in the Pacific is still raging, and yet over in the US, um, they managed to assemble a huge group a meeting of all the major powers, um, excluding the Axis powers, obviously, yeah. to talk about what happens at the end of the war economically. What, how did it come about and what were they aiming to do? I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because it is, it's often forgotten, isn't it, that this, this was all happening. Bretton Woods, this, the, the great kind of post-war settlement was actually happening while the war was still on. And, and you know, it, it, certainly the war in Europe was looking far better. D-Day was just kind of happening, but D-Day was looking to have been a success at that stage because this was literally a few weeks after that. Um, but, you know, V-1 bombs still falling on London. Uh, as you say, war in the Pacific wasn't, uh, wasn't you know, going absolutely brilliantly. And so uh, there, there was this, this kind of surreal moment where both the Axis powers and the Allied powers were thinking about, well, we need to try and sort out the world's economic system afterwards. And there was this recognition, I think, that, that after the First World War, the settlement was such a mess, you know, whether, whether that was Versailles, uh, reparations, the fact that the gold standard kind of fell apart in 1914 and was never really properly put, ta put back together. So there was a sense that, listen, we need to deal with the economics first and foremost. And, and both actually the Germans and the Nazis had their own plan for, for what they wanted to, uh, to do with the post-war economic world. Uh, in fact, part of, you know, partly it was seeing that plan, seeing mm -hmm. news of that plan that got the Allies onto it. Keynes was sent a note, this is what the Germans are planning. He was told, you know, can you disabuse us? Uh, can you produce some propaganda showing just how nonsense this is? And he, of course, you know, being John Maynard Keynes, the great kind of economist, uh, he took it back and, you know, not someone you can dictate to. He took it back home, looked at it for a while, came back the next day and said, well, I think it's actually rather good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the only thing yeah. I would change is I would change access powers for allied powers. And that was kind of the, the moment that they started to look at what do we do about this. Of course, the plan that eventually kind of evolved, Bretton Woods, w you know, was very different actually to those original uh, Nazi plans. But uh, there was this recognition that economic settlement, sorting out the international monetary system was the first thing that had to be done. Because I think these guys realised more, more I, f I think, than, than we do today, the link between economics and economic problems and war. And in their minds, the two things were totally kind of intertwined. You know, when they were discussing what they needed to do to try and sort out the world's economic system, it was because if we don't, there will be World War Three. And they, you know, they say that repeatedly. Um, and Keynes was obviously involved in the World War One settlement and, and saw how badly that had gone, uh, burdening the Germans with so much debt that effectively well, arguably led to the rise of Nazism. Exactly. I mean, he, you know, that, that was really his moment where he became a celebrity. And he was, you know, he <laughs> was one of the few genuine international economics uh, celebrities. Sadly, not so many of them these <laughs> days, for better or for worse. But um, he, yeah, he was the man who foresaw the breakdown that would happen after the First World War. Uh, he was there, you know, in Paris in 1919. And uh, so he was looked up at, as, at you know, at, up towards as the guy who knows how to sort things out. And so, you know, he and Harry Dexter White had been kind of plugging away, talking to each other, fighting a lot of the time. They couldn't stand each other initially. Um, Keynes on the side of the British, Harry Dexter White on the side of the Americans. Uh, and they absolutely didn't get on to start off with. Uh, they'd been discussing the shape of what they wanted for the, the post-war system. Uh, they wanted something which, you know, they weren't yet kind of able to conceive of a world that, that had floating rate currencies, which was kind of interesting because that, that was an idea that was starting to gain currency at this point. point. Um, some of, actually, some of Keynes's colleagues, Lionel Robbins, was, was slightly more keen on a floating rate currency. But for most of them, that just seemed anathema. You had to have fixed exchange rates. Um, but the, 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 the nature of the system that lay beneath that uh, was rather different. The British, you know, um, is kind of relatively well established, wanted a system uh, whereby uh, you would be kind of punished for, for having a big surplus as well mm -hmm. as having a big deficit. Uh, there would be an international currency potentially, uh, whereas Harry Dexter White, and you know, we, it's clear why Britain wanted that. They were the biggest yeah. deficit nation in the world. Whereas Harry Dexter White and the Americans wanted something which, which you know, 
basically resembled the IMF as it later uh, transpired, where you still would kind of discriminate against debtors rather than against surplus nations. And when talking of Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes, this was they, they arrive at this place up in up in the hills and it turns out to be a bit of a mixture between a huge celebrity party <laughs> with magicians and dancing, singing, swimming pools, yeah. um, suspicious looking ladies with blonde hair wandering around with yes. the Russian delegation. Yeah, I'm glad you've read and, the book. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's now coming yeah, across. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, uh, tell us a bit about, uh, about what was going on. Because obviously Keynes was on his last legs to some extent. I mean, he died a year later or something yeah. like that, but was very, very ill and in fact, it was thought that he was dead at one point and reported that That's he was dead. That's right. Harry Dexter White turns out probably to have been a, a Russian spy. You know, it's an yes. incredible mix. Don't give too much of it away. Okay. okay. <laughs> but no, no, yeah, all of that stuff was happening. And it, it's, it's astonishing. I mean, I was, I was struck, you know, when I came to this, you know, as someone who has, has uh, spent a while covering economics uh, and so is interested in it, but also as someone who, I suppose, looks at things from a narrative perspective as well. Um, I was I was shocked to find out how much of a great story it was, just in, in a narrative form. Uh, you, a lot of the, the previous accounts of this have been either um, quite dry economic accounts about what was eco Bretton Woods really the right economic system, and there's some very interesting questions about that. Um, and looking maybe at the genesis of what was discussed at various stages in their negotiations, but very few that actually looked at the drama of those three weeks in New Hampshire. And like you said, I mean, this is, you know, hundreds of people coming from around the world, holed up in this hotel in the middle of nowhere, really in the middle of nowhere. A lot of them had grudges with each other. They didn't get on particularly well. Uh, there were very long nights indeed, lots of boozing, lots of drinking. Uh, I mean, Keynes was worried at the start. He said that, you know, uh, that it was likely that you know, severe alcohol poisoning would set in before the end, which I think for a, for a number of the, the candidates kind of started well before the end. <laughs> um, the Russians were drinking all the time in the bar downstairs. As you mentioned, Keynes was very unwell. Uh, he had had a heart attack, uh, a few heart attacks actually. Uh, and uh, the, the entire reason that this was held in New Hampshire, or part of the reason it was held in New Hampshire, further away from Washington, was they wanted to be somewhere which were where the air was a bit cooler. This wasn't, you know, there wasn't widespread air conditioning at this stage and mm -hmm. you know, hot temperatures were not good for him. So all of that was happening. It was a bit of a kind of cauldron uh, of different uh, kind of emotions. And for much of the three weeks, there were lots of, you know, there was lots of shouting. Uh, there was lots of uh, deep discussion about the, the world economy. Uh, and there was lots of kind of um, merrymaking, I think, you know, that the, there are many documents that survive from that period, which I kind of have, have flicked through at various periods, documenting just how much people were drinking downstairs in the bar while negotiating the world's most important economic agreement. But, um, I mean, do you think the fact that the, the US negotiator turns out probably to have been a Soviet spy influenced the American settlement at all, or, or was that kind of peripheral to... And it's fascinating, I mean, actually, the, so he, what we now know is one of the members of the Russian delegation uh, was likely to have been an informant at the very least for N the NKVD, so the, the precursor mm -hmm. to the KGB, um, a guy called uh, Nikolai Chichulin, who was there at... Bretton Woods itself, and we know that the two, the two, he and Harry Dexter White may, met uh, a number of times, both there and later on. Um, we know that certainly some documents were passed by Harry Dexter White to his Soviet counterparts. Um, w what we don't know is the extent to which he viewed it as espionage, rather than just being a kind of you know prolific uh, personal diplomat. You know, was he just discussing uh, things? Was he doing his own course of shuttle diplomacy? And I think there's, there's an argument to say that there might have been a degree of that because certainly he, you know, you've got to remember the dynamic here. He's from the Treasury, the US Treasury. They are fighting, They're, there's infighting within the US government between the Treasury and the State Department. The State Department wants desperately to be involved in creating Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. They want to be involved in the creation of the International Monetary Fund and all of these things, just as they are central to the creation of the United Nations. Um, whereas the Treasury is saying, no, listen, you know, keep your hands off, this is ours. So I think there's certainly kind of an element of Harry Dexter White trying to do his own diplomacy. Um, the question is whether he went too far and whether he passed too much information to the Soviets. And certainly, you know, uh, a lot of what he got up to looks quite shady in retrospect. But again, as well, and I, you're probably kind of gathering from this, I, I, I have a you know, relatively equivocal view on this. I think you can, you can call it a type of espionage. Um, 
but in hindsight, some of that stuff, some of the stuff that looks shady might not have felt so shady at the time. Yeah. And you've got to remember that the, the Russians were not viewed with quite the same degree of skepticism in 1944 as yeah, they, they were, were still a couple of years later. At, at the time. Yeah, um, at the time. And, and, I, and, I, and, and not just allies, but actually the people who were winning the war in yeah. Europe. You know, they were, they were winning a city a day. And actually, you know, there are all these kind of references that Keynes and other people make to, you know, every time the Russians win a new city, uh, we think about giving them an even bigger quota at the International Monetary Fund. Yeah. So they are, they are kind of po popular. But certainly there are big question marks over what Harry Dexter White's uh, you know, his, his motivations were. And he is a fascinating character. We know a lot about Keynes, you know, his sickness and his, his personality and the, stuff, the, the astonishing yeah. life that he led, not just economics, but yeah. everything else as well. We know so much less about Harry Dexter White. So that, that, you know, the precious stuff that we have and that I've come across um, is interesting because in a way, for me, he's just as interesting a character, if not more, than Keynes. Great. So at the end of Bretton Woods, what would you say the outcome was? It, it's still unclear. Was it a dollar standard, a gold standard? And, and what happened over the next 30 years in terms, we had a period of, uh, of prosperity uh, around the Western world and we saw lots of the developing nations also start to catch up and have their own little economic miracles. Do you think that was a, a result of Bretton Woods? Um, we had the formation of the IMF and the World yeah. Bank, but at the same time we also had things like Marshall Plan pumping money into Europe. Mm. You know, was, was it lucky that the period that Bretton Woods agreement existed for was a period of low inflation and strong growth, or was it because of Bretton Woods? I mean, it's such a good question, and you know, I kind of started working on this perhaps to try and you know, find out the answer, because this, this came of thinking about the recent crisis that we've been through, everyone was saying we need a new Bretton Woods, and I was like, okay, well, you know, can we actually properly define what Bretton Woods was and, and, and what the conference actually involved? Um, and, you know, probably shock horror, I didn't come to a conclusive <laughs> answer, uh, it being economics. Um, certainly, uh, there, are, there are a number of factors about, you know, t as you mentioned, between 40, late, late 40s, so kind of when Bretton Woods really kicked in towards the late 40s, and the early 1970s or late 60s, that period of uh, economic growth was stronger than in any previous comparable period, whether it's the gold standard, whether it's what's happened subsequently. Um, there were fewer financial crises, fewer bank collapses, fewer external defaults of sovereigns. Um, it's difficult to find any statistic where it doesn't look better during the Bretton Woods period than any other, um, and which is why I, you know, I imagine everyone keeps saying we need a new Bretton Woods. I imagine, you know, my feeling is it's down to a number of factors. I think, you know, you're right. The Marshall Plan, a lot of money being pumped into this system. Essentially, the U.S. basically kind of financing the world economy for a period of time through Marshall Aid uh, and through, you know, kind of running down its current account surplus. They're enormous factors, they are. Um, there are demographic factors. You know, the de yeah. demography was very positive at that period, wasn't it? Um, and I think also there's an element of um, when you have a new system, there is you know, a period of stability that just enshrined from having, we have a new system that's relatively coherent and we understand it. And with the benefit of hindsight, it's only a couple of decades, isn't it? It's not uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a, short a period. relatively small period. But, uh, but I think, but that, and you know, there's this theory of, you know, I think it's called the theory of hegemonic stability. When you have, when you have a clear global leader, like the United States was, you know, it was this almost unprecedented period of having an obvious kind of, mm. you know, this is the big power. Because power. the UK was gone as a superpower. The UK was out. And, this, and again, it's, it's what, what makes this period such a fascinating moment is this is the moment that crystallizes, really. I mean, we, the UK is already on the way out since World War One in terms of, you know, its, its preeminence. But this is really the moment that crystallizes it in, you know, both the legal structures and practice of the way that the, the international economy works. But I mean, to get, I mean, to get back to your question, I think that Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods must have played some kind of a role in this. And I, uh, you know, I can't help but feel that some of the, for instance, things like r agreements on flows of capital, um, which were more kind of heavily policed during this period, um, that there might well be a connection between that and between incidents of financial crises. I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't seem like such a crazy kind of suggestion. Um, so, you know, undoubtedly, I think it contributed towards making the world a more stable place. The interesting thing for me, though, is that that didn't go hand in hand with low growth. And there is this kind of preconception, isn't there, that if you're going to have more controls on, on capital yeah. and on finance, that, that that does inherently mean that you, you're not going to have growth rates. It, it wasn't the case during Bretton Woods, which is something 
I hadn't really kind of appreciated and it's worth bearing in mind, I think. I mean, so what does that lead to your conclusion looking forward? Because obviously currency war has come back in mm. uh, as, a, as a thing, hasn't it? People thinking about competitive devaluations uh, again. Do you think that there is any clamour for uh, a global currency system again or a global economic system? Yeah, not, not, I mean, not in the kind of, uh, in the near or medium term, I'd imagine, just because it's something that the you know, United States would just have nothing to do with and they are still going to be the dominant force in the world economy for such a long period of time. You know, this was unique about this period. It's one of those few, a few times, actually, you know, when the United States was really kind of taking part in international uh, multilateral affairs. Yeah. You know, Roosevelt was determined that, there was, that the US was going to take the lead in setting up these things, not just these things, but, you know, what became the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, all of those kind of international organizations. They were also very keen on uh, trying to create some kind of a, a European Union in the future. The, uh, the US was off, after that. Because the OECD, actually, which was set up to administer Marshall Plan 8, um, was also in some ways, you know, it helped to encourage the formation of the European Union as well. So there's an interesting uh, kind of analogy there. Um, and I guess uh, thinking about the European Union um, and the problems and imbalances that exist there today, you mentioned it earlier, uh, Keynes was very keen that people with surpluses bore equal blame and responsibility as the people with deficits because they, they must all even out. Mm. And maybe that, with, with Germany slowing again, uh, be becomes uh, a bit more relevant. And it does. And start thinking that surplus countries are equally responsible for sorting out the problems as well as... Greece and yeah, Spain and Portugal. because you're all in it together, aren't you? And even if you're a surplus nation, at some point you're going to have to take the hit if no one's going to buy your exports. You yeah. know? See, that's what we're witnessing in the, at the moment in the Eurozone. It's trying to export its way out, but it's questionable about what the weather demand for that's going to be, isn't it? And so there are, which, you know, whence derives a lot of the criticisms that you hear from kind of Larry Summers and a lot of other people about what Germany's doing. I think, I mean, you know, it's, it's never been more relevant to think back to, to that period because the issues that were being discussed in 1944 were precisely those kind of issues. You know, how do we, de how do we determine the settlement between a country, you know, when you have a country with a big deficit and a country with a big surplus, how do you try and square that circle? And that's precisely what Bretton Woods was designed to try uh, to ensure, you know, to prevent in the future. I mean, to go back to your kind of previous question, I don't... I can't conceive of anything like Bretton Woods happening today. It's, it's just, you know, we've been through the world, the biggest crisis since the 1930s. There were some efforts at reform, but very few. It just, we, I don't know whether we put, put too much anaesthetic into the system, quantitative easing and things like that, that meant that it wasn't as painful as it could have been in many countries. Mm. And so the impetus to reform and to make the kind of enormous cataclysmic reforms that you need to try and reform in the international monetary system just were never going to happen. Um, and I don't think, I, and that's one of the disappointments of the last few years. There was nothing like Bretton Woods. But whether we could have anything like that today, I mean, I don't think, I think that the era of fixed currencies, I, what about gold? I mean, well, the gold standard, it, yeah. Will, it, it, will gold make a comeback ever? Well, there's always going to be there, isn't relic, it? Yeah. You know, it's, as a kind of obsession for, for, yeah. for people that are... I mean, my, my favourite thing about gold is that the, the, the genesis of the gold standard, everyone kind of assumes, well, gold, yes, gold is, gold is the ultimate uh, kind of source of, uh, kind of store of value and currency and so on. But in reality, actually, a lot of, throughout most of history, silver was a lot more common as the, the standard of choice. And the only reason, really, that you had a gold standard in the Victorian period is because, say, Britain was the main uh, kind of world economy at that point. Isaac Newton, uh, towards the end of his life, he became the master of the mint and had to work out the kind of, at that stage, the UK was bimetallic, it had silver and gold, and he had to work out the ratio of silver to gold within the currency. And that ratio is quite important because if you suddenly have a lot of silver on the scene, then, you know, your supply demand kind of different differential between those two things kind of comes into play. And people can arbitrage it and start trying to take money out mm. of the currency. And that's precisely what happened. He got the ratio wrong. Uh, and as a result, people started taking silver out of the currency and all that was left eventually was gold because of the way he did it. And so that's how the gold standard came into place and eventually that became the thing. There was a gold standard, you know, silver's not involved in it. 
And then the UK was obviously at the centre of the world economy, and then everyone adopted the gold standard eventually, and it came across to the US. And that, you know, that's, that's historical happenstance rather than kind of predestination. And yet, people still remain obsessed with gold today. Um, and I think that, you know, I, uh, here's the interesting thing. I, I, like I used to think that there was no chance of going back to anything like the gold standard today. Because, I mean, we, you know, we all know it was barbarous in terms of what it implied for people's living standards. You know, people had to face enormous kind of, look at the 1920s in the UK when it went back to the gold standard kind of unemployment you know, rising to, to mass levels, deflation of uh, kind of like 20% over that period. That Churchill's biggest mistake. Churchill's biggest mistake, exactly. Um, and if you look at that and see the pain that it kind of you know, wrought on people, I kind of think to myself, well, I always thought, well, it's just inconceivable, particularly in an era of democracy, because that was kind of pre-mass franchise or when mass franchise was coming along. But then you have the general strike, you have the kind of rise of the mass franchise. Would people really ever in a democratic system sign up for something where so arbitrarily their living standards can be affected. I, I thought, no, that would be nonsense. But then, you know, look at the euro. You've got a system there, which is kind of like the gold standard without the gold. You have massive deflation in Greece and Spain and countries like that. Clearly, people are not happy in Greece or indeed Spain. Um, and yet, it's still just about hanging together. So is that a kind of hallmark for saying you could have a fixed rate kind of currency system that's a bit like the gold standard across the world? I don't know. But we're seeing what we're wi living out is a kind of live experiment in mm. the, you know, the gold standard. It's, it's not gone very well so far, has it? But, you know, the, it, it means that I guess it's not entirely inconceivable. They, you know, gold, whether you have gold in the middle, it's just, again, it's arbitrary. But, you know, it's never going to go away, is it? No. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Ed. This is a brilliant book. Really recommend it uh, in the bookshops now. Thank you. Thank you. Four long years of intensive work have gone into laying the groundwork for this day, the day upon which the International Fund and Bank take their places in the mighty arsenals for peace we of the United Nations are so carefully preparing. The government of the United States is resolved, as I am sure are the other governments represented here, to do all in its power to make these institutions an outstanding example of the results that can be accomplished by the united action of those who want and are willing to work for a peaceful and prosperous world.